Hello, my name is John Nordberg. This is the fourth part of a science film that covers truly life-changing physics. If you have started watching this film at a point other than video clip one, then stop, find video clip number one, and start at the beginning. Really, you cannot fully understand how these fusion power plants work without first understanding the new physics described earlier. I highly recommend that you view all of the video clips for this film in order. In my opinion, this is historical. If my new physics is correct, then this is an amazing moment in history because we can now benefit from fusion energy. Historical forces have converged. This is a unique moment. It is time for fusion energy. It is time for us to start building commercial fusion energy power plants. Let us examine how these historical forces have converged. First, the economics. Some people claim the world has already guzzled half of its oil. I cannot substantiate that. However, it is obvious we are burning through our carbon fuels at a very fast pace. Thus, the cost of energy has been soaring. For most of my life, there has been a real fear that at any time, the United States could be clobbered by an oil crisis. Fusion energy will enable the United States to be 100% energy self-sufficient. It can significantly reduce the cost of energy. Energy prices should drop and then remain stable. Second, there are many social forces converging. People want cleaner energy. People want safer energy. People want to replace carbon forms of energy with greener forms of energy in order to reduce carbon pollution. Keep in mind, fusion is the cleanest form of energy. When all aspects are considered, it is the safest overall form of energy. Fusion is the greenest form of energy. However, because the costs of energy have been increasing at an alarming rate, people are troubled. We can't just recklessly take our current energy sources and chuck them out the window without causing a recession that could last for decades. Fusion energy can save us from this problem. In essence, fusion is the best way for us to create energy. Third, if my new physics is correct, then we now have the breakthrough scientists have been looking for. This new physics explains why prior fusion techniques have failed. This new physics is the key to fusion energy. Using this new physics, I have engineered and have already been issued the patent for a new type, a new class of commercial fusion power plant designs. If my fusion power plant designs work, then we now have the technology people have been looking for. Finally, this is a time of synergy. All the forces are converging economics, social forces, physics, engineering. What is next? Synergy. As more people learn about this, the politics will, be, will come together. As more people learn about this, the capital, the money that is needed, will come together. While thousands of people already know about this, I need millions of people to know about this new physics and this new type of fusion power plant. Now is the time. Now is the time for everyone to finally understand time. Now is the time for this new physics to become the spark in the conscious minds of millions of people. Now is the time for people to start using and benefiting from fusion energy. Now is the time to benefit from fusion energy. A report by a group of prominent scientists stated that there is no silver bullet for solving our energy problems. They are wrong. There is a silver bullet. It is fusion energy. Fusion is the energy silver bullet. Fusion energy is our best source of energy. Now let me start explaining the details. The fusion power plant designs 
I have engineered take advantage of the new physics that I've been describing. My designs both contain the hot fusion plasma and extract energy from the hot plasma by using spherical electromagnetic fields. Researchers have intensely studied fusion since the 1950s. I've been following this research for 35 years. I believe I know the reason why the fusion researchers have had so many problems. Unfortunately, researchers have always designed their machines to just obey the right hand rule. Most fusion research now centers on tokamaks. This graphic is a cutaway of a tokamak. A tokamak is like a large donut. Tokamaks are engineered using the right hand rule. The right hand rule is used in tokamaks to keep the hot plasma confined in the center of the torus. The hot plasma must stay confined. If the hot plasma touches the cool walls of the core, then the plasma will not remain hot enough for the fusion reactions to take place. This not only applies to tokamaks, this also applies to my designs. In a way, this is great. Think of this as a great fusion energy feature. This feature contributes to making fusion energy very safe. If anything goes wrong in a fusion power plant, for example, if the containment field is breached, then the hot plasma touches the cool inner wall of the core and then the fusion process immediately stops all on its own. In a tokamak, the hot confined plasma flows around the torus, kind of like a current in a wire. It is red in this graphic. It flows around and around. There are a number of ways to heat the plasma. When the plasma gets hot enough, fusion reactions take place. Then, unfortunately, instabilities form and the magnetic confinement breaks down. Let me show you why. To simplify this, think of plasma as acting like current flowing in a wire. A magnetic field wraps around the plasma according to the right hand rule. When the fusion reactions happen, essentially a miniature explosion takes place. In general, these miniature explosions could happen anywhere in the hot plasma. It is impossible to know ahead of time exactly when or where they will take place. Let's look closely at one of these miniature explosions. Let us zoom in on the hot spot. Essentially, there are three layers. The inner layer is the region where the fusion reactions are taking place. This is the hottest area. Next, moving outwards, there's a shell of very hot plasma. It's been heated by the fusion reactions taking place inside of it. Next, going further outwards, is the regular plasma. This is the regular plasma that is going around the torus. While this regular plasma is hot, in this situation, it is much cooler than the very hot plasma that has been heated by the fusion reactions. To recap, there are three layers. First, the inner fusion region, which is the hottest. Second, the very hot plasma. Third, the regular plasma. It is hot, but not very hot. When the fusion reactions take place, the shell of very hot plasma that surrounds the fusion reaction suddenly has a lot more energy. This shell of hotter plasma pushes outwards because of this extra energy. The cooler plasma outside the hot area cannot resist this energy. The cooler plasma cannot push inward and stop the hotter plasma from ballooning outwards. Okay, think of this copper ball as the expanding hotter plasma. The cooler plasma flows around this hotter expanding plasma. Think of the hot plasma as deflecting the cooler plasma. Initially, the bulge almost always starts out as a roughly spherical shell. This is just like the experiment that I showed earlier, where the current flowing along the wire meets the metal ball and flows over it. As soon as the spherical bulge happens in the plasma, it triggers the formation of a natural spherical electromagnetic wave. This is just like the experiment I showed earlier. On one half of the wave, the magnetic field curls to the right. On the other half of the wave, the magnetic field curls to the left. Then the catastrophe takes place. On one half of the wave, the magnetic field reverses its direction. It flip-flops and is facing the wrong direction. Because the fields in a spherical wave are self-attracting, or in other words, self-confining, 
these spherical waves of plasma sort of act like a particle, like a quasi-particle. Keep this difference in mind. Even though the forces between the hot plasma particles, between the particles with like charges, always repel each other, the forces between the fields in the spherical wave can still attract each other. They can be self-confining. This is a fundamentally different point of view. Looking at this from the point of view of fields is more fundamental than looking at it from the point of view of charges. The charges are determined by the fields. How the spherical wave waves combine determines the charges. Plasma researchers have spotted these quasi-particles in fusion plasmas countless times. Quite frankly, they have been baffled by them. They call these spherical waves of plasma, these quasi-particles, a variety of names. One fairly technical term is magnetic islands. My two favorite names are plasmoids and blobs. Up until now, the plasma scientists have not had a theory that was capable of correctly describing these plasmoids and blobs. Yes, they are blobs of plasma containing charged particles. Yes, in the plasma, the charges that are alike are repulsive. But no, the plasma scientists did not have a theory that correctly described how the fields in a spherical wave can create forces that are self-confining. There's no doubt about it. My grand unification theory describes these baffling quasi-particles. I find plasma research very interesting. In one textbook on plasma science, I came across a drawing that showed what the author thought the field lines for magnetic islands would look like. I found that drawing intriguing. It was very close to describing the fields in spherical waves. It almost showed the field lines exactly like they occur in a spherical wave. In another case online, I came across a plasma research facility at a university. They have constructed a large plasma device. For me, this is an extremely interesting piece of equipment. Part of me is jealous. I want one. This device has a long, thick tube. The tube is surrounded by rings of electromagnetic coils. These magnets keep the hot plasma tightly confined in the middle of the tube. On one end of the device, they have a dipole antenna sticking out. This antenna makes waves that flow down the tube through the hot plasma. In essence, they are trying to create these plasmoids and blobs on purpose. It is too bad that experiment used a dipole antenna rather than a spherical antenna. That is what I would do. Oh well. If they did, they would essentially have a pulsar in their device. Anyhow, they have created 3D graphics that show the electric and magnetic field lines of the waves they are creating. Their waves are not truly spherical because their dipole antenna is not spherical. Therefore, they have not been able to correctly describe the field lines for spherical waves. However, the waves they are getting are very close. They have almost exactly described the field lines for spherical waves. Let me get back on track. Tokamaks will never work. Mm -hmm.